Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 67 of the podcast. It's the 12th of April, 2017, as I record this intro. In this episode, I chat with Anna Black about her de-schooling experience. Anna is a former Montessori student and teacher, now an unschooling mom to two lovely daughters in Australia. It's a wonderful conversation as we dig into conventional wisdom like kids need to do things for themselves and fewer toys is better. We also have a great chat about how unschooling children develop their own moral compass. Um, and when we were talking about her daughter's interests, Anna forgot to mention her eldest daughter, Abby's big interest in ball jointed dolls. You'll hear some of the history behind her love for dolls in the interview. And one of her older friends is starting a junior ball jointed doll club where they will get together and make things for the dolls and talk to adult doll collectors. She says it's a really cool community and such a good example of unschoolers finding their own interests and mentors. Uh, Abby's doll has a public Instagram account, and there's a link in the show notes in case you'd like to follow along. Uh, Abby's also been experimenting with nail polish and makeup recently. She has amazing nails and is incredibly neat with the details. And she's definitely having lots of fun. As for me, this week, I've been enjoying the shift to warmer weather. Yay! And I definitely have the mosquito bites to prove it. I've also started reading the book Emma and I will be discussing in our book chat episode next month, Rethinking Autism. It's a collection of essays edited by Catherine Runswick Cole, Rebecca Mallet, and Sammy Tamimi. It's really interesting so far. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I deeply appreciate your support. You guys inspire me, and I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who's curious to learn more and explore this wonderful lifestyle. If you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote is from our guest, Anna. One of the greatest things that I think unschooling has given me and our whole family is the idea that it's actually okay to be nice to your kids. Now, let that sink in for a minute. It's okay to be nice to your kids. Conventional society has gotten so far away from seeing children as people. Parenting has become just another job that we have to do to train them to be productive adults. But children aren't material assets for us to shape and mold. They are people. And I love that Anna sees that as one of the most valuable shifts that has come with unschooling. It's okay to be nice to your kids. It's beautiful. And now, on to the interview with Anna. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Anna Black. Hi Anna. Hi Pam. Hello, hello. Anna is an unschooling mom of two and her family lives and learns in Melbourne, Australia. Anna actually mm -hmm. helps with creating the transcripts for the podcast and after falling into an interesting chat about de-schooling, I was excited when she agreed to share her experience in more detail on the podcast. So, to get us started, Anna, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and how you first came across the idea of unschooling? Yes. Uh, well, my husband and I met in high school, so we've been together a long time. <laughs> but we didn't have our first baby until uh, we were 34, so there was a long period of time there. And before that, I was, um, I was a Montessori teacher. I also went to a Montessori school, and my mother is a Montessori teacher. Ah. So, so I'm probably about as Montessori as it's possible to be, or I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So yeah. So anyway, that's what I was doing before before my first my first girl daughter was born, and um, she was I guess probably high needsy kind of baby. So she uh, you know she didn't sleep. She needed a lot of touch and comfort, and so we moved pretty quickly into a, a, an attachment parenting mm-hmm. kind of. Uh, way of being with her she yeah she just exploded all my ideas of how a baby would be basically yeah and yeah like they they do I guess but I've I've actually always thought if, if she had been an easier baby we wouldn't be here at all mm-hmm. she's um it's really because of her that we we've even come this way at all so yeah so I, I think probably from from Moving from an attachment parenting type of community, mostly online, although I did have, I also had quite a few friends because uh, our version of the, do you have the Lelechi the Le League in Canada? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we don't have that. We have our own sort of version, which is the Australian Breastfeeding Association. Ah. And uh, we were, I was a member of that and I went to their meetings. Um, lots of, so yeah, lots of attachment parenting of older kids as well as well as an online community. And the idea of not unschooling but homeschooling kept coming up in all of those. And I'd always thought the kids would go to Montessori kinders and Montessori schools, um, which I still did at that stage. But that was the uh, probably the first looking at all the online type discussions was where I first came, first saw. And I remember when I first saw the, the words radical unschooling, it was in this magazine that's not around anymore called Kindred Magazine, and it was actually written by a father about and, – and looking back now, it wasn't a very good description, but it was a kind of a description of, of moving from a very controlled, particularly around food and technology, uh, way of being with their child. And it, looking back, what they did is just opened up the floodgates immediately. And I remember reading about how she was just allowed to eat – 25 caramello koalas, which are these little chocolate things, and, you know, watch Dora for seven hours straight immediately. And and I remember thinking, that sounds crazy. <laughs> um, and just sort of dismissing it. But that was, I remember that was the first time I saw the words radical unschooling together in that, in that magazine. But then I went from um, a kind of home birth website here to their connected homeschooling site, and it was like a natural learning type site and I Sandra Dodd started did uh commented a little bit perhaps she must have had a maybe a search engine or something where you know um and she maybe she was notified about people discussing it but Mm -hmm. she came on and and explained a bit about about unschooling and radical unschooling and, and that's where I first started to read the always learning lists and some of her other writing and and it really all came from that that is really cool I I love that, that, uh, well, probably maybe somebody got in touch with her. You know, that's the neat thing about the worldwide community, right? You know, somebody's always kind of pointing out, oh, there's this over here. Can you come up? Like I was tagged today in something. Mm -hmm. And and after we chat, I'm going to (laughs) go, you know, because, yeah, there's something, you know, for a local kind of question that I can help with. So I think that's a a really cool uh, cool thing about the the online community Um, yes I was wondering with your Montessori background which is very interesting um what it was so now you've kind of heard of unschooling um you you've had your vision of it kind of uh straightened out a bit you know having uh, encountered Sandra with a a bit more um of an a idea of what what it's all about what was it that you found appealing about it at first that you uh, started looking at it in more detail well probably with the with the Montessori background there are quite a few commonalities really um, particularly around general learning I think especially if you go back and read her original books which I had done because I had you know studied and qualified she focuses a lot on the power of of children's concentration mm-hmm. 
and valuing that concentration and observing to look and see what's what's drawing them in and what they're interested in. And even if as an adult you can't see any value in that, to trust that that's what they need and that's where the learning's happening. So that philosophy base, actually I, th- I thought it was very easy to, to, uh, to, to make a bridge into unschooling with that in mind, I think. I, I think that she would... There was a, there's a lot more, um, I guess, even though that is a central tenet of, of that philosophy, there is also a lot more um, ideas around control and what children need to, to flourish and that sort of thing. Although she was also very hands-off in lots of ways. She said basically if adults would, would just get out of the way, children would um, would sort of flourish. Uh, so, so some of it really connected really well. Mm-hmm. But... I think as, especially as years went on and, and, you know, if you look at the photos of her original classroom, she has sand pits, she has dolls, she has teddies. A lot of that was pruned away mm-hmm. and still has, you know, it's still an institutional, it's still an institution. It still has the negatives of the, all the classroom stuff that, uh, um, that we see in just in any classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and some of the ideas that it held very strongly, I started to see looking at my children that they just weren't really true. <laughs> they just, they didn't, uh, yeah, they just weren't true. Um, <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't true that they, that they moved steadily through, a, you know, a planes of development and it wasn't true that uh, those sorts of things just stopped making sense, I suppose. Um, plus it was actually some scientific um, I think uh, Meredith Novak talks about this sometimes because she has a bit of a Montessori background too. Uh, the idea that there are sort of sensitive periods for learning and if you miss them, then that did it. There's no point. Mm-hmm. And I think that that has mostly been or certainly been challenged by by kind of nearest the, the latest neuroscientific research. So there was that there was that sort of thing. Some of I guess some of my um, I don't know. Some of the things I believe pretty strongly were starting to fall away a bit and it made me look at everything, I think. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just started to see how my children and and all children really, that they, they were less, less predictable and, and less, uh, less sort of one size fits all. Uh, type of, hmm, yeah, I think that's where I started to come away a bit and move towards, um, towards unschooling, which is, which is so much richer and less limiting. That's so interesting. Like it's very, very cool that you found, um, the commonalities, uh, about, uh, in, in learning, but mm. with your own experience, with your own kids, there were some of the, the other aspects. I love that word predictable. You know, you were talking about how um, the, you could see with them that their learning wasn't, you know, steady, predictable um, and, and those windows, you know, so, so aspects of it were um, you were questioning from your own experience now, right? Yes, I was really, I, and I think that actually started way back when my first daughter was a, a newborn, mm-hmm. uh, and she just didn't do what anybody said she should be doing. Um, but when I allowed, you know, when I did gave her what I could see she needed just from being her mother, that that was what worked. Mm-hmm. So that's that's when it, it started. I think my my moving away from the idea of kind of external predictability uh, into really giving them what they really needed That's and what they thought they needed, not what I thought they needed. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that it worked, right? Like you were saying, cause <laughs> so often you, you get these messages like you should be doing this, you should be doing this. But if I look to him, you know, cause my eldest also started me off on this journey, right? Yes. It, when you actually, you know, just pay attention to them and respond in ways that will work to, you know, the messages that you're getting, that works. <laughs> it does. It does. I know. It's just like, but, but, but no, you know, and, and he's the one I'm mm. living with, right? And he's the one I mm. want to have the relationship with. So, but it does. It's, it, 
it takes um, a bit of fortitude to choose that over the conventional messages that you're hearing around you, right? Mm. Or even, you know, to be to question I, the, your Montessori background in that you had been to the school and your mom and you had been trained and, you know, to yeah. to be able to do that takes a little bit. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I guess it does. I realized I forgot to say earlier how old my daughters are. Oh, okay. I've got Abby, who's 10. Um, Abby is 10 now, and Evie is 7. Excellent. Um, when I listen to the podcast, I always like to know how old everyone's children are. <laughs> <laughs> That's I know how old mine are. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so did they ever end up going to Montessori? They did. Abby went, she went at three because I was still very, uh, very, by that stage I had, I thought, well, what I really want is I want to, well, I was still thinking homeschool at that stage. Yeah. Um, homeschool her for primary school and maybe high school, but I really still very, very strongly believed in the importance of the Montessori environment between three and six mm -hmm. because that's where all of, really all of her focus was. And certainly that's what my where my focus was. So it was, I was still in that idea of, you know, uh, there's, there's special things about their brain and, the, you know, the wonderful, uh, beautiful equipment is really important to, to build those those future skills. I was still very much in that do most of what I was doing was focusing on what, what they would be like as adults. Mm -hmm. I was still very much in, in that, in that mind, mindset at that point when she was three. So I really couldn't let go of, of – I really felt that I would be, um, I guess, doing her a big disservice if she missed out on this, this beautiful environment. And there was a beautiful – is a beautiful Montessori preschool nearby. Uh, I knew the teacher well. I knew her training, so I really trusted the environment because there are a lot of bad centres out there. So she did. She went at three and she didn't love it. I have to say, she tolerated it, I would say, most of the time. Um, she made some lovely friends who she's still friends with today. And by the time she was five turning six, which was her last year there, she had a great year. And if you ask her, she'll say she loved kinder, mm -hmm. which is not true. But it's, it's, it's one third true, I suppose. She didn't like the first two years she was there, but she did love the third year she was there. Uh, my other daughter, Evie, who is uh, nearly three years younger, she did one year. So she just went as a three-year-old for a bit. She quite liked it. But, um, but by, the time, uh, by the time Abby was finishing and we decided we were going to homeschool, I, we gave Evie the choice. We said, do you want to go back to kinder or do you want to stay at home um, with mummy and Abby? And that's what she chose to do, which I, I knew she would. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who she is, but yeah, so that's how we did it. So she did, they did both do some and Abby did quite a lot. Okay. So what did the first few months of, uh, your actual starting unschooling look like? So I'm just wondering if you started out cause you were talking about, you know, homeschooling at first, did you start with a little bit yeah. of structure and loosen up or did you just kind of, um, take almost like a vacation for a while and and then just not get into the structure or I'm curious to hear what it what it was like for you guys yeah no we because I by that time I'd really come fully to unschooling mm. and I had read a few things uh, you know recommendations saying just just live as though it's a holiday yeah. you know just how you go and I knew we'd have some adjusting to do we were also about to move house so that was another big change that was uh -huh. happening around that time uh, so we finished because our school years are a bit different to yours. I think we finished in December. So we finished up and we had sort of the six week holiday and we just kept going. Um, we didn't really ever have any, any, any kind of structure. I don't do particularly well with structure. I don't really, it's not, doesn't suit me at all. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't really suit either of the girls, which is handy. I've got yeah. friends where that. You know, they're, they're kind of more like me and their kids really thrive with, with more predictability, but my, my girls are both a bit like me, so we like to be spontaneous. And um, so, so yeah, I think our main or my main focus at 
during that probably that whole first year really was finding uh, new friends for my older girl Abby who is always been really social even though she's quite shy or ha- can be she her friends are really important to her and she had lost all of her kin friends which she would have anyway because they were all going to different schools but that's not you know she didn't really understand that yeah yeah so yeah my main focus during those early generally the first six months and I would say even the first year was finding children that that she connected with and we were really lucky we we went to a couple of meets of just a, a park day a homeschool park day and she made a friend straight away, which she always does if you put her in with, with kids. She, I just took her to a birthday party on on Saturday. Uh, she only knew the birthday girl. And by the end of the party, she was just, yeah, she knew everybody. They're all <laughs> <laughs> she, people. She draws people. She's she's very charismatic. She's a lovely, lovely kid. Um, so we found a couple of friends pretty quickly. And then we went to, uh, Sandra Dodd came out to Melbourne and other parts of Australia too. And she did like a two day sort of seminar. Mm -hmm. I think it was in about April of that first year. Yeah, that sounds about right. And I didn't, we all had our suburb names on our little name tags, which was a good idea on the part of the organizers. And, um, somebody who saw, my new suburb name where we hadn't actually moved to and she noticed or she heard me say that we had a daughter of of about her daughter's age and she lived nearby so we didn't actually meet at the seminar but she found me online later on Facebook and um and we met up and the girls it's yeah we've stayed friends the girls are really close and there's a boy she also has a son who's about my other daughter's age and they they get along fantastically as well which is always Really convenient to <laughs> have <laughs> friends. And we've got a few, and Melbourne's lucky. We, we have a good homeschooling community and actually a really good unschooling community as well. Um, a lot of them listen to this podcast. Oh. <laughs> and, in fact, you had you, you had one of my one of my uh, friends, Jo Isaac, as mm-hmm. well. You, you've spoken to her before. Um, so, yes, we're lucky. I know no, not everybody's in that situation, I don't think. But, yeah, finding friends was, was, um, was the... I thought it might be a problem, but it was no problem at all. My oh. girls have got lots of great friends. That's awesome. So yeah, so that, was our, that was our first year, really. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. You kind of, you uh, went to the end of the school year, so you just yeah. kind of had your school vacation and just continued on with that, eh? Yes, that's yeah, right. That's awesome, that's awesome. Yeah, and, and that's nice to find local local friends. We and We did not have a lot I mean this was this was quite a while many years ago now um yeah yeah so we did travel to go to conferences to uh meet other kids who were in schooling but then you know we also had the kids also got involved in in activities um that they were interested in and found some friends that way but um yeah then well I mean it's fodder for lots of conversations about the the differences um in parenting styles in school and that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. I wouldn't say, um, certainly not all of our friends. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, in the, they still have friends who are at school as well. So we see them during the holidays. Um, and they have made a few friends from activities, but it, it, it their, their best friends are all other homeschool kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, it's, just, it's a time thing as much as anything else. I think. Exactly. Yeah. They're much more available. <laughs> Mm, yes. So I think uh, one of the conventional ideas that we wrestle with as we de-school is that um, to foster independence, we should never do things for the child that they can do for themselves. You know, but with unschooling, that logic doesn't hold. I mean, I know, uh, speaking of you know, conventional parents, there was a lot of times where the parents would say, oh, well, you can do that. You know, you tie your shoes, you do this. Um, but with unschooling, we do things for our children when they want us to, regardless of whether they can do it for themselves. And I was wondering if you could share how you worked through that shift. Yeah, that was probably one of the big, uh, the big shifts because that is a very, mon- <clears throat> excuse me, very Montessori idea. Mm. Independence is um, is really is really seen as as a, an important 
building block in, in children's character and it helps, you know, helps them feel good about themselves. And so I think it, it comes from a really positive place, yeah. this idea of doing independence. It's not, you know, it's not, a con- not at least not in a Montessori classroom, it's not a convenience thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is considered to be vital for the, for the child's, you know, integration of their, of their personality, which is a much harder thing to let go of than... Um, Oh, it's a bit more annoying for me to have to tie their shoes. If you think that you're doing something, you know, that might damage your child by tying, tying their shoes, that's a little bit more difficult to let go of. But um, I think it was it was just reading and I remember I was letting go of all my ideas around, around the idea that children and adults were different. Mm-hmm. That was a big part of it. Was that you? You know, you 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 have to relate to children in a completely different way to how you relate to adults, and not that I'd ever really spoken to them differently, but the idea that they were different, that their brains were different, that they needed different things, I think, was a big part. I had to let go of a lot of that, and I think it was probably Joyce Federal has written a lot about, um, you know, would you help a friend? Would you help your husband? Would you help your sister if they asked you to? A, you know, is it nice when somebody makes you a cup of tea, even though you can make a cup of tea yourself? Yeah, yeah. and that that is that was a bit of a light bulb. I thought, oh yeah, of, of course, <laughs> of course, it's it's nice when people do things for you. Uh, why why would that be any different for children? Um, and it just means that allowing them to be, if they feel like it, to be be babies again or be big kids if they want to be. So uh, so that was, that was yeah, I, I think that was probably where I came from with that. And I'm just, I know that's in the next part, but I think I'll say it here. One of the greatest things that I think unschooling has has given me and our whole family, I suppose, is the idea that it's, it's actually okay to be nice to your kids. Mm. Yep. You know, that's fine. Um, You don't have to, I don't know. I I mean, it sounds so silly to say that, doesn't it? But uh, (laughs) But it's really, really true. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's not going to damage them if you are as nice as possible to them. Um, I I don't know. It just seems like such a a funny thing to say. I know. Yeah. Just everywhere, this pervasive idea that it is not okay to be nice to them. It's just everywhere. Uh, and, yeah, so that, that's that been so freeing, just, just being thinking I can pick, I can carry her if she wants to be carried or I can sleep, you know, I can go to sleep with her for as long as she wants me to or I can make pretty plates of food up even though they can do it themselves. And, in fact, my 10-year-old is much better at that than I am now. <laughs> I, you know, all those sorts of things, just nice little things that you can do for them. It, yeah, it just, yeah. It, anyway, it, that was it's about the of- it's about the relationship, right? I, I mean, when, you know, I think people are always so worried. If I do that for them, they're going to expect me to do it forever. And, and you know, Joyce's she always brings it back to, you know, adults relationships, right? If you do something for a friend, does your friend expect you to do that for, you know, next time and next time and next time? No, Mm. it's, it's, it's when you can help out and it's appreciated. And yeah, that to be able to change that and, and realize that kids are people too, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. That they don't have to tie their shoes 300 times so that they'll be able to do it when, you know, when they're adults or something. I know it does. It does seem silly when you start trying to talk about it, but it really is a pervasive attitude that kids need to be able to look after, you know, look after themselves um, as quickly as possible. Right. And they need to be able to do it. They need to be able to do it. They need to have been doing it for 10 years before they they can do it the next time. Right. (laughs) We have YouTube now. You don't need to scrub a toilet for 10 years to work out how to do it. It's, just look it up. It's fine. And they know how to look things up. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think also it, it, it's just more of that either or or the black and white type thinking because, of course, a lot of kids 
<clears throat> really want to do things for themselves mm-hmm. most of the time. Uh, or they want to do certain things for themselves and not other things. My, my seven-year-old is like that. She is really fiercely independent about a lot of things, but they're not others. So you can't say yes always or no always or, or this is always good or this is always bad because it, it really just depends. And, you know, that's another thing that um, crossed my mind when you were mentioning that. We don't know what's going through their mind at that particular moment when they want to be, say they want to be independent and they want to do it themselves, right? We So we can use our patience to let them do it at their pace and their speed because it's something in that moment they really want to do. And then maybe in the next moment there's something else and they would really like us to do it for them, you know, and we don't need to know exactly why they want to do A and not do B, but there's reasons. They have reasons. So whether it's our patients to do something for them um, that we know they can do, but they want us to do it or us to help, and then patients for when they want uh, the time and space to do it themselves, it's all about really respecting them as a person, right, and helping them out as as we can in whatever way um, they're asking for. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, to me earlier that one of your biggest shifts coming to unschooling was around general abundance. And I was hoping that you could explain what that looked like for you, because that was really interesting. Yes. Well, it, it's partly from that same idea. It's OK to be nice to your kids. But mm-hmm. it, it, and it stemmed from some of the philosophical stuff I, I have been working with um, as a Montessori teacher. Because and and some of the some of the things that she wrote and other people wrote about her. It In a Montessori classroom, I don't know if you've really sort of been inside one, there's, there's one of everything. And there's lots of things, but there's one of each of those things. And the idea behind it is that it helps children develop, you know, or basically self-control and, and waiting and, and uh as well as making it easier for them to, to choose things if there's one clear thing. And, I mean, it, it works in a way. Uh, and it's certainly, certainly the rooms still feel very rich because there's still, you know, 200 different things to do. But uh, it doesn't translate very well to a, a house. Um, but I remember I had very strongly taken on board the idea that children couldn't bond to lots of dolls or lots of cuddly toys. So they should have one each, one oh. of each. Um, so, and the idea, and I've I, I've heard this. I, I mean, you hear this everywhere, and all the kind of, especially in the natural parenting type circles where I did come from. The idea that you know, it's much more, it's much more. Um, what's the word? A moral or or a, to have you know have less things. And that you have fewer things, that leads to more meaningful play and meaningful activity and valuable interaction. Do you know what I mean? That, that yeah. kind of idea. That mm-hmm. It's really very strong in the natural parenting community. You know, that they should just play with sticks or yeah. uh, one toy on a shelf, um, one open-ended toy on a shelf. Yeah. That those are the only kind of morally acceptable toys and if they're not playing with those or they prefer to play with the flashing light thing uh, with all the music and the buttons, then that's actually a, a failure on the child's part. Ah. And that, yeah, because the, people have this the, this image of the ideal child in their head and mm-hmm. it's not the child that's playing with the Fisher-Price music table with all the lights, but they love those. <laughs> you know, my kids adore those, adore those things. And so I think, yeah, I think it was shifting away from the um, what's good for them. You know, I know what's good for them and what's good for them is one toy or minimal numbers of toys and only natural material toys. So all that, yeah, it's like minimalism and uh, non-materialism 
Mm-hmm. And the idea that, you know, a two-year-old that wants 10 Barbies is going to grow up to be a, I don't know, Monsanto well, executive. Did, did that have something to do with, I, I know sometimes I hear, um, like, that if they have too many things, they won't use their own imagination. You know what I mean? I think, <laughs> yes, it absolutely comes down. You know, the toy does all the work, this kind of idea. But if, if they don't have... You know, if, if the toy gives them too many ideas, it takes away from their own ideas. And all you have to do is watch them for two minutes to see that's not the case. I know. Uh, Somebody had asked me about that, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago. Um, <clears throat> and they were talking about how, you know, their child was, was watching some TV and, and was acting out um taking cues from the shows and playing with the toys that way. And it looked like she was losing her creativity. But, you know, I said, actually, you know, creativity is all about connecting different things in new ways, you know. And I shared Steve Jobs' quote about creativity, which I'll put in the show notes for people. But creativity um, is really connecting things in um, in new ways, basically. But... I said, that's the epitome of creativity right there because she's taking a little bit of this and she's connecting this toy and she's uh, creating a new story with these other characters. And, I mean, just watch her, right? She's being completely creative with all the different things that she's got um, access to, right, that she has made connections with. And she's making new ones uh, like crazy as she's playing with all these ideas and all these things in front of her. So, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and I, also, I think it's just it, so much of it comes from the adults, you know, adults' ideas around, well, minimalism really and how yeah. that is just, it, it's just morally more acceptable to be that way. And if they see their children you know, not being that way and wanting lots of things, then they, they, they get worried and they think that that's that's the person that they are. Mm-hmm. Again, it sounds really silly when you say it, but it's definitely what people think. Um, and I just think that generally and watching, so anyway, yeah, getting back to how I sort of moved away from it, I'm just trying to think. I remember um, I remember a big, I have this really, I should, my, Abby must have owned, she wouldn't have even been three. I don't even think we had two yet. We were in a toy shop and she loved baby dolls at the time Mm -hmm. and it was near Christmas and I had a baby doll to give her I knew she was getting one from somebody but she fell in love with this other one at the toy shop and she just loved it so much and she wasn't talking much at that stage but she was saying you know baby baby and cradling it and I remember I had this huge amount of conflict internal conflict about whether I should buy this doll I could afford to buy the doll that was fine but it was the idea that should she, you know, should she get that doll? Should she have that doll when she was getting already getting another doll? And would that spoil her experience of dolls? I mean, it really does sound silly looking back. She was too. Anyway, I bought her the doll and, you know, she loved this doll and we called it Big Baby for a long time because the other one she got was small. So we had Big Baby and Little Baby. Oh. And then we just more and more. And, you know, I could just see – and I started to remember back because my parents were always very generous with us. There was no sense. Whatever they could get for us, they would get for us. And Christmas was huge at our house. So and I just remember looking back and, you know, the joy of a new Barbie, even though even if you had a whole pile of other Barbies, I, I really remembered how sincere that was and how, you know, how many happy memories I had around that sort of thing. And I just wanted them to have that. Mm. I didn't want uh, and I, I just, so I basically just threw all of that out and I started to look a lot more at what they were really doing. And I remember I had to just uh, talk with a friend. It, it was around Christmas, you know, it often comes up around Christmas. And that stupid poem that people say that something to wear, something to read, something they want, something they need, you know, you get four mm-hmm. things. I just, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. Do people think that children will do that and that they will then take on the the kind of morality behind that? How they'll just be resentful. I don't. It's just imposing 
adult values on a child and expecting them to then take those on. And that's not how it works at all. Yeah, I was going to mention, you know, even if uh, the parents are are feeling um, minimalistic, maybe, you know what I mean? You know, if they find uh, that's their preference, but to not impose that, you know, on their children, because that may not be. um, They may have those values, you know, it's not my job to get value what I value. It's my job to support them in their own values. Yeah, as they explore and figure out what those are, you know, and that's the whole piece. There's nothing wrong with with sharing our perspective on things. But as as long as I always hesitate to say that only because, you know, um, it's so easily to easy to share it with a lot of loaded expectations kind of behind it you know, and kids are smart. Yeah. They can figure that stuff out. <laughs> yeah. I also think it's not, it's disingenuous to say, well, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I want to share my opinion or I want to, you know, yeah. this is my perspective. I, I need to be able to share my own thoughts and, and values as a parent to a child because the power differential is so exactly. extreme. Exactly. Yeah. You're not yep. sharing with a friend, you're sharing with the, and, and, you know, a, a, a developing personality who who looks up to you who looks up to you I mean even you know I I hate it when my mother doesn't approve of something I've done Mm -hmm. and I'm 44 so it's it's not a fair it's not a fair transaction it's it's disingenuous to say it's it's the same as sharing with a friend or a partner or whatever because it's not the same yeah especially Um, if you're bringing up the conversation Right. If it's yes. something that comes up in conversation and just, you know, a, a word here, a sentence there, that's when yep. they're interested. That's when it's information that they're looking for. That's when they're curious about mm-hmm. it. But for us to bring it up, that that comes with more power, doesn't it? Mm. And I think yeah. it helps to like I, I, I do generally believe that there isn't an absolute right usually. Yep. I guess there are certain instances when there is, but they're not asking me if I think human trafficking is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> they're saying, what if we don't always recycle everything? You know, it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. But, um, so yeah, when my, when my girls ask me things, I do tell them bits and pieces about what I think, but I also say not everybody thinks that. And some people think this and what do you think? And, um, so I don't, I don't, I don't talk a lot about what I think about actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that 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 was something that's really was actually really important for me that I found so helpful and freeing was not um, saying a lot, you know, not offering yeah. up um, too much of my opinions um, because to see them figuring out and making connections and that next step and that next step was just fascinating to see. How, and they figured stuff out, you know, logically, <laughs> and you know, they had they had reasonable and interesting opinions about things. And if I kept jumping in too much, um, they they wouldn't have uh, the freedom, you know, or the the op- the space the space to make those connections on their own. If I kept jumping in trying to put in my two cents all the time, right? That's right. And I don't know, I don't know if it's just, I'm thinking particularly of my older daughter right now, but I don't know if it's, if it's her, just her personality or because she's got had lots of time to think about things because she doesn't have to go to school. But she has very, you know, deep thoughts and, and opinions about things. <laughs> One of the things most recently, and we have a dog. And um, he's a purebred dog. He's from a breeder who's an excellent breeder, you know, very ethical. But he's not a rescue dog. He's not, you know, he's not. We didn't adopt him from a shelter. Mm -hmm. And Abby feels really guilty about that. And she talks to me about it, has talked to me about it quite a bit. And we've had all kinds of conversations about the different ways we can support animals. And she's planning at the moment to hold a fundraising store. She's, she actually has done it before. She raised about a hundred dollars for um, a couple of different animal charities, but she's going to do it again. But I never thought about that sort of thing when I was 10. Yeah. It's just, I know. Yes. 
space that she's having to develop her own kind of moral compass, I suppose. And she said to me, you know, when I grow up, I'm, I'm only going to have animals from rescues, which is great. It's obviously not how I feel because I, I bought our dog. <laughs> um, but she doesn't have to feel the way I feel. She's also a vegetarian. Um, I am too, so that, that kind of goes together. But I think she's, she's having the space to, to develop her own ethics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not stomping all over her with mine. It's so true. And I think that's one of the huge pieces is because um, conventionally we worry so much that, you know, we need to that 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 is something that we need to teach our children. Right. Yes. Yet Mm -hmm. they if if you can step back, um, you know, not ignore, (laughs) but give them that space. It's amazing that, you know, the the ethics, the morality, the opinion, the everything that they will, that they will develop. Like uh, my daughter, she's been vegetarian since, I don't know, 10, 11, maybe. And nobody else in the family was, she just, Mm. you know, came up and said one day, you know, this is what I'm doing. And these are the reasons. And, you know, that was great. And that was fine. And she still is. And she's, you know, in her twenties now, um, they they will think for themselves, right? Yeah, and around just around that sort of idea of abundance, I think the way I've looked at it is, I if we kind of as parents, so my husband and I, and he's he's always been this way anyway, but um, we give them just really as much as we can uh, mm-hmm. in every way, not just emotionally, but also materially. If we we really show them that what they want and what they value is important to us, which is what I think is, is one of the keys to an abundant kind of mindset. Mm-hmm. It, there's, you know, that make it so that even if you can't afford everything, show them that what they want is as important to you as what you think they should want or what you want and show them that you'll, you'll try and get it. There'll be yep. some, you know, some way to try and get it. And, Neither you know, for years, especially my youngest. She, I remember when she was about three. I, I was. She loved to go buy and buy a toy. You know, that was just her favorite thing to do. And if she, if she had a choice of what she'd like to do, that's always what she chose to go and buy a toy. And so I was trying to say, well, we could go to. Um, well, we call them op shops. I don't know, charity shop. Some. Ah, what yeah. would you? We call for them op shops. Come, yeah, yeah, yeah. It comes from opportunity shop, but we call them op shops here. And I said, we could go to the op shop, you know, because they've always got lots of toys for, you know, $1. And she said, <laughs> she said, hmm, I really only like toys that come in the boxes with the clear plastic at the yeah. front. <laughs> so what she meant was new toys. She, she yeah. wasn't. And I said, okay. And we went and found her something and it was fine. But, but now I can't get her to buy a toy. She's, she's not, she's done that. She's not. She's really moved away from wanting to buy, go shopping, from wanting to buy things. Um, and I might, it might come come back again, but yeah. So again, that idea that if you give them everything, they'll suddenly become they'll become entitled and I want everything. It's it's just the opposite, or at least that's mm-hmm. been my experience. Neither of mine are interested in very interested in buying things anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's been my experience as well. <laughs> and it makes sense from the whole. You know, the, the psychology of scarcity, of course, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely, that's what happens. But somehow we can't translate that. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, we should probably move on to the next question. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. Um, again, from your Montessori background, uh, yeah. where they uh, hold quite conventional views on children's use of technology and the need to control access to that. I was hoping you could share a bit about your experience with that journey. Yeah, I'd say it's certainly not as strict as Steiner, for example. Uh-huh. Um, she actually never really said very much about that because she was writing. Well, no, I mean, that's not true. She wrote when there was television. Um, uh, but there is a, definitely a feeling that until they're six, they should be dealing mostly with the real world, children. So the recommendation is certainly to limit. Um, there's never any, like there's never computers in classrooms, for example, under six-year-old classrooms. There are in the primary school rooms. Um, and 
there's also, I guess, probably also the focus is very much on on reality rather than fantasy. So or pretend. It, it, so that all goes together, and, and I and I did move away from that because I'm trying to think where it started. But something made me. It was specifically television at this stage, and something made me decide to look up all the actual the actual studies on the recommendations for you know, under twos, Mm -hmm. um, television. And I read the ones I could find. I think they were the ones linked by the American Pediatric Association. And I just wasn't very impressed with them at studies. You know, they were small sample sizes and they weren't really very well designed and they only had very small differences. You know, they just weren't really convincing as, as research studies. So, yeah, I think that was what made, made me start to think, well, maybe that's just... Again, maybe that's just not true. <laughs> the technology is a problem. Maybe it's um, just not true. And I had done, I was reading a lot about, you know, all the, all people who, radical unschoolers who had older children. And mm, anyway, the idea that it was, was fine, that they, that they did great things with technology. And yeah, so I never, there was never really a lot of conflict around that with the kids because I had started to read and let go of my ideas about that when Abby was about three and she really wasn't, hadn't been asking. So I hadn't been, you know, saying no. Um, she wasn't particularly interested in television until she was a bit older anyway. So so that was fine. That was that actually the technology, that was a reasonably easy let go. Yeah. And I would say because it's less less of a focus in Montessori than in Steiner. I think it was probably, yeah, I think Steiner people have a harder time letting go of technology being evil, the idea that technology is evil. Uh, I still do have some little slip-ups. Uh, I've still got a bit of de-schooling to do, particularly around, um, well, the latest one's been around YouTube because the girls love YouTube and they get heaps of great stuff out of it. But I, I was starting to worry a bit that, um, that there was – that there was a bit too much YouTube going on. Plus, it was very convenient when I needed to get things done. So I think I was moving a little bit away from being very engaged with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've just shifted that a little bit now, and I'm I'm just making sure that you know it is an actual choice that they're watching YouTube and not just kind of a um, oh I can't really think of anything to do and and Mum's not paying any attention. So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, so because it's yeah it, it's. It is easy to watch and that means I can do a lot of other stuff, but that's not, yeah, that's not really how I want to do things. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're, anyway, things come up still. They still come up and you have to work through them. Yeah, well, and, and things like that that you mentioned, those are just good clues for us, right? You know, so we can check in with ourselves. Oh, you know, is is this a relationship thing? Am I feeling a little bit disconnected? What can I do to fix it? Yeah. You know, because life... Yeah. So those are just bits of life that come up and, and we just want to be paying attention to them and, and digging in. What does this tell us? <laughs> yeah, I find it particularly important with my with my younger daughter because she doesn't, for her, YouTube specifically is a very um, private activity. She doesn't want to share it. Yeah. So she doesn't want me to sit with her while she watches. Mm-hmm. She's, not, she's not watching anything that she shouldn't be. But uh, So it's not like yeah. watching a movie. It's not like watching a movie for, with her that we can sit and chat and cuddle. It's, you know, and yeah. it means that I and she's not. She's my less my less verbal sharer as well. Like, yeah, my, my older daughter, I know everything that's going on in her mind most of the time because she 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 talks it. Whereas my youngest, she's much more internal. She's much more introverted, and um, I have to be, and I'm not. So, I'm yeah. I talk a lot and I'm extroverted. So. My younger girl and I are more different than my older one, so I always try and be very aware of making sure I'm staying very connected to her in different ways, in the ways that she yeah. likes. Um, so yeah, it's easy. It's easy for me to slip out of connection with her. Um, well, no, that's not true. I don't slip out of connection with her, but I just am, am, am aware of it, I suppose, as a yeah. as her personality. Yeah. So what are your children enjoying right now and how are they exploring their interests? Yeah, you've mentioned YouTube. Is that yep. the main one right now? Uh, I wouldn't say so. My Abby, she loves – she's been loving The Sims recently. She's she played The Sims before, but she's just got back into it. She's 
found out how to download custom content, um, which is a big thing for her. So things that people have made, new things, and um, how to get that onto her games. So she she really likes making the people. I think that's her favourite part of it at the moment. So she loves The Sims. She loves actually. She loves making things. She loves making everything. She um, she does. Well, she cooks. She's a fantastic cook. She loves to make, like just yesterday she came out, this was something she got from YouTube, and she found she wanted to do make a bubble sock. She found a plastic bottle and put a sock over it and made, you know, bubble snakes. And oh. um, she, yeah, so that that's often what she, oh, she, she, you know, she loves to felt. She makes little, does needle felting a lot. And she, yeah, so I would say she's definitely, um, a person who makes things Mm -hmm. Um, and she does that lots. She also is very, um, very skilled socially. She's, uh, you know, the, the gardener's theory of the seven intelligences or the eight intelligences. Uh, Hers would definitely be interpersonal. Mm -hmm. So, um, friends are really important to her and she's very good at friends, which is great. So we see her, we see friends of hers two or three times a week um, at least. They both do drama, which they've been doing for the last, this is their third year of doing this, this drama class, which they love. And they've also both started horse riding recently, which they're really enjoying. Um, my youngest is very physical. She loves gymnastics. That's probably her favourite thing. We, For her seventh birthday, we, we set up our old um, kind of converted garage is a little gymnastics room for her with mats and and uh rings to swing on and um we have a trampoline and so she and she just cartwheels around everywhere so I saw pictures of that that was lovely (laughs) yeah she's just a really physical child she you know she jumps on and off the couch all the time and Mm -hmm. um and yeah and she goes to a class once a week which she loves as well and she's also, she does it, my husband apparently did this as well as a child. He really remembers it. She spends quite a bit of time, I'm a dramatic player, I suppose, making up these games completely by herself and mm-hmm. and playing them just in the backyard and sometimes the dog's involved. And I can just see her walking around in the backyard talking and mm-hmm. sort of gesturing and clearly playing something Um and again, it's a bit like the YouTube. It's 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 very private. So I have to be a bit careful about watching. She's yep. she's not always keen to be watched. And and um yeah, so that she's she has lovely friends as well. She's uh she's a funny thing. She's she really makes me laugh. But, <laughs> so those are probably her main things that she loves. And they both do love. Um, yeah, they 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 use YouTube a lot. They use. Oh, we go lots of places. Um, we're coming up to our term holidays, which would be quite nice because all of their activities will go on break a bit now, which will be nice to just spend some time at home, I think. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Mm. It's, yeah. I, I love hearing about what the kids are up to. It's always so fun. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very busy. Yeah. So I was curious what your, how your husband's feeling about your unschooling lifestyle. Um, was he on board early on as you were transitioning to it or what's his journey looked like up to this point? Well, I remember when I first, um, I first raised the idea of just homeschooling when, yeah. when Abby was a baby and he described his thought process as homeschooling. Only weirdos do that. And then the next, the next thought was, hang on, but I hated school. So <laughs> it's funny because he's actually a university lecturer, but he, um, oh. he, he didn't like school, but he, he did love uni. So he very quickly accepted the idea of homeschooling. That was no problem. And I would say probably especially when they were younger, he was the more natural um, unschooling parent. He never had any issues around things like abundance or um, – you know, doing whatever would help them be happy right then. Uh, as they got older, he's probably had a bit, a few more worries. Um, he, both of them read really well, but neither of them really read for pleasure, which he's a bit sad about, I think, because he loves to read. And actually I do too. 
So I think, yeah, I think that's sometimes that's you just need to let go of what you thought they might like and then look mm-hmm. at what they like. Um, so, yeah, but apart from that, no, he, he's, he's always been on board. Uh, he listened to a few of your podcasts, though. I think the one with, with Roya. Oh, yeah. Uh, he really enjoyed that and, and it really kind of helped him feel, feel good about what they might do, you know, as adults. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I actually mentioned earlier, one of, one of the big things I've, I've sort of come to do, around to doing is, is not constantly thinking about how what we're doing now will affect what, what, what they're like, you know, in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, because so much of, of kind of mainstream childhood is just preparing them to be adults. And it's, not, it's not appreciating and making right now fantastic because you're worried about the effect it's going to have on their, their kind of adult character. And, yeah, I think he's, he's probably a little bit slower to come to kind of that idea because he, yeah, he worries about them as adults, of course. He's their dad. He wants them to have a great life. Um, so, yeah, we have lots of, well, well, not lots, but we have had chats about that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's um, awesome. Mm-hmm. I'd be curious, um, what has surprised you most about your journey so far? Um, I made a little note here and, and I've just put that it's worked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know my kids are still only young, but, uh, you know, they really did learn to read without being taught. You know, they, re- they really, um, they really are lovely people, uh, that I think much, much better people than I am, um, mm-hmm. The idea that just, you know, as imperfectly as I managed to do it, that allowing them and supporting them to develop into who they are uh, is working. It's they're, they're confident, they're happy, they're, they've got fantastic relationships with each other and with both of us. They're very different, the two of them, but they get along. They just adore each other and are really kind of, really connected and, and protective and they argue sometimes but nothing like nothing like what I see some siblings and with the with how different they are in personality um, mm-hmm. I think that could easily have happened if they had had that sort of separation of school so that's something I'm really grateful for so yeah I think it's how how it really does work and it's I don't know I don't know if it's easy. We say it was easy. It's hard to quantify. It is. I just, I loved that response that is where you, because, you know, when you first hear about it and you first hear about, you know, the lifestyle and, and uh, other unschooling kids and everything, you go, wow, you know, is that even possible? Yeah. And, and, and there's, there's that first trust, you know, okay, I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. It's just right. like, Wow, it does work. Yeah, it does. And and you know, we've still got long, you know, we've still got many years ahead of us, but um they're just You've got that foundation. Yeah, and yeah, they they they're such they're such amazing people. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm just glad I get to spend lots of time with them. Yeah. And I guess on that easy piece, you know, I guess it all depends on on whether you consider it work. I mean, for me, I think of it as easy, as in I'm always engaged with another person. So it's not me trying to figure stuff out on my own, right? So Mm. in that way, it's easy because I'm in relationship with them and I'm connected with them and we're all figuring stuff out together. I mean, like you said, they're, they're pretty brilliant and they have great ideas and, and you know what I mean? So it's always a give and take and we're in this together. Um, so I'm never like all alone trying to figure stuff out, which Mm. seems harder, you know? So, but I mean, if you're expecting, you know, for your kids to tie their shoes and and do that all on their own and that from the moment they're born, um, the whole point of of being their parent is to get them further, to need you less and less and less. Yes. That that could be hard, you know, if that's your goal. But 
when when you um, drop that need and just uh, connect with them and be with them, it's it's pretty amazing and and not so hard. It it's just yeah. time, but it's time you're choosing, right? That's what you're choosing to do with your time. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And ah, uh, I don't know. I I have plenty of friends who have kids at school, and that doesn't look any easier to me. It looks a lot harder in many ways. Yeah. Yeah, because you're not doing, because you're trying to get people to do things that they don't want to do. I mean, even yes. the parents. The parents don't want to be standing over, you know, making sure their homework's done. You know, so it's not, so much of it isn't fun for anyone involved. At least we're we're having fun with the things that we're choosing to do, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's so cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Anna. That was so fun. Oh, it's a pleasure, Pam. Thank you for asking me. Oh, well, that's wonderful. And uh, before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? I don't really have an online presence particularly. I write on some of the uh, Facebook groups on um, Sandra's Radical Unschooling Info and uh, Unschooling Q&A. But, yeah, that's all. So, yeah, in those Facebook groups? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I will share those and people can join and watch out for you if they'd like to. Okay. Thank you very much. And you are starting your day, aren't you? Yes. Yes. We'll be. Uh, <laughs> yes, we've got a few things on today. <laughs> Yay. Well, I am going to go have a bite of dinner and slowly make my way to bed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you Thanks. so much. Have a great time. And you too. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the Tuck Talks. For six years, I hosted the Toronto Unschooling Conference. It was an amazing experience and I loved meeting many wonderful unschooling families. Though I no longer host the conference, the unschooling insights shared by the amazing speakers over the years are timeless. You can listen to all 25 talks for free on my website at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash conference. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.